I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, our Applied Plant Sciences seminar series. And uh, it is with immense pleasure that I'm introducing today our first speaker this semester in uh, Matthew Gilbert. So before uh, I start, I'd like to give a few quick uh, reminders. Questions will be answered at the end of the seminar. And uh, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation, or if you wish, um, you can raise your, hand, raise your hand at the end and uh, your mic will be opened uh, so that you can ask uh, your question. Alrighty, so Matt uh, is an associate professor in, in plant sciences. And as you see as well, he's a currently vice chair, another big hat. Um, so he's uh, also a plant physiologist at the Agricultural Experimental Station at the University of California, Davis. He obtained degrees from Rhodes University in South Africa from 1998 to 2008, where he earned his PhD. His uh, postdoctoral work focused on soybeans, during which time he was a sustainability fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University from 2008 to 2012. His work focuses on how plant physiology scales up to whole plant function in ecosystems or so agricultural environments. Current foci include developing technology to manipulate air temperature for climate change research, research phenotyping for bean drought tolerance, bark physiology and development. And uh, maybe he says, uh, plants that predict tomorrow's weather, which would be excellent. Uh, the title of his talk today is a lot of hot air, conceptual tools for climate change and crop water use research in which Matthew uh, advocates for an approach of um, kind of taking a step back and evaluating the basis of our science rather than just accepting repeating past experiments in new circumstances. What are the assumptions for our methods? Uh, what are alternative explanations for the patterns we observe? He will illustrate this approach with a couple of examples. So with that said, I'll stop here and give uh, the floor to Matthew. Uh, please join me in welcoming again, uh, Matthew. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you. And thank you, Walid. So um, my, my sort of life philosophy surrounding science is to go out into the world and with whatever I experience, try and collect tools that I can use. And often those are experimental techniques. So when I read a paper, I collect these experimental techniques, but they can also be conceptual approaches. And so I thought it'd be particularly useful given that we're in a situation where many of our abilities to do lab experiments or field experiments are limited because of COVID over the last year, that maybe we should spend more time looking at conceptual issues um, because they don't often rely on in field in person um, stuff. And so the kind of conceptual approaches I'm talking about are taking a step back and saying, uh, what are the limitations or assumptions of the approaches that we currently use? Um, maybe there's a better tool out there for the job that we have at hand. Um, and maybe there's an opportunity to create new tools. And those could be experimental techniques, but often I think about conceptual approaches as being a good starting point. Um, so for instance, you can um, use a chisel to open a can of paint. And you can use many of these tools to open a can of paint. Um, and there's nothing wrong with using the chisel in the sense that you still open the can of paint with it. It's not ideal because you hurt the chisel and you might hurt yourself. But the point is, is that there are good tools and, and um, there's not necessarily one tool that's the best. Um, and then if this is, so I often, um, like to speak to graduate students. So if you're starting your career, I would recommend this kind of approach and try and take a step back and evaluate where you are. And this can be kind of daunting in that you may not have the math skills or the technical skills to develop new approaches. But what you find is that there's often other fields who have developed approaches that you can borrow. So the classical example is in plant physiology, um, you can go to microeconomics and find a business, um, a mathematical model for a business where they maximize profit by allocating resources around the business. And you can apply exactly the same model for microeconomics. You can apply it in to plants where the business and the profit is growth or reproduction and the resources are carbon and nitrogen and water and things. So you don't have to invent things yourself, look at other fields. And so today I'm gonna to talk about um, water use uh, research and how we, can approach that conceptually, and then about new directions in climate change research. And I'll start by giving you some uh, novel approaches to, to various problems as examples. 
So I should acknowledge some of the people that have made this possible, people who've worked in my lab or worked with me like uh, Nico or Paul Gaps. And I'd like to point out Tom Sinclair and Ted Shaw as people who've had a large impact on my research. Um, my conversations with them have been incredibly valuable. And I think they're examples of people who've taken conceptual approaches to agronomy in particular. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, funding agencies. So um, here's a very simple example. It is uh, related to what is your breeding or biotech goal if you're breeding for drought tolerance or drought resistance. And so by taking a step back, we can look at that goal. And first thing that you might realize if you looked at drought resistance or drought tolerance is that plants don't actually respond to drought. Drought to me is, is a lack of inputs into a system. So if we imagine that the soil or the field is a bathtub full of water, then it's precipitation and irrigation are inputs of water and drought is the cutting off of those inputs. Now plants don't actually experience drought. What they experience is the soil water deficit. And so whether or not a plant responds to drought is determined by how big the roots are, how deep the soil, what type of soil it is, how deep the soil is, and also the outputs. So drought is not simple. It's not just plant response to drought. There's many things going on there. And unless you break that up conceptually, you're not necessarily asking the right questions. So um, a graduate student, Viviana Medina and I, um, thought about this and gave, a, gave some options. So um, a plant is in its environment and whether or not a soil water deficit develops and therefore the plant needs to respond is partly dependent on how much water the plant uses. So that's one type of drought tolerance is avoiding a lack of water in the soil by using less water, let's say, or exploring uh, deeper, having roots that explore deeper in the soil. Um, and then there's a whole hierarchy of other things that the plant can do or a breeder can um, breed for to achieve drought tolerance that focus on if the plant is stressed or if the plant gets damaged and, or either avoids damage or if it gets damaged, it tolerates damage. And by taking a conceptual approach to this, we can um, more in a more nuanced way determine what experiments we do and how we phenotype for these issues. So let me give you a concrete example of that. If breeding for drought tolerance means that you're breeding for differences in water use, then that water that is or isn't used is going to um, result in differences in soil water deficit between different genotypes. So these are beans in the field in California. And because we've got multi-row plots of beans here, the ones in the center here, this is all one genotype, they can develop very different soil water deficits over time. And you can see how that impacts their uh, productivity. On the other hand, if you're interested in how plants respond to stress and, and tolerance of say flowering in response to stress, then you probably want a field that's much more uniform in the soil water. Um, and so you would plant rows of beans or, or crops right next to each other so that there's more homogeneity and you can compare them much more directly without differences in soil water deficit developing between different genotypes. So I think that's a very clear example of how a conceptual approach helps you break down a problem and design a better experiment. And again, neither one of these is correct. It really depends on what your question is as to which one you should choose. Um, so another example of a conceptual approach has been our work on almonds. So almonds are trees that grow in incredibly hot and dry environments. And what we realized, and I think this is true of all plants, is that if you had a high air temperature, the plant might be a bit stressed. And if you have high light, which is always the case in California at least, the plant might be a bit stressed. And similarly, if you had a high soil water deficit and the plant closed its tomato. But when you combine all three of those together, that's when you get damage. And we were able to show that by monitoring chlorophyll fluorescence on these trees and chlorophyll fluorescence, fluorescence tells us about photosynthesis. Um, but bearing that in mind, we could now take that as a, a conceptual approach and try and apply it to something in, in a more important setting. So I'm never sure if people know what the Farquhar von Kammerer Berry model is. It's 
the photosynthetic model that we've used for the last uh, 40 years or so. And it is one of the most important models in the world in that we use it in all our climate change, um, global climate change models to predict how plants are gonna function. So it's the way in which we predict the future of plants in the world. In many crop models, but not, not all of them, this photosynthesis model is also the basis of crop productivity for crop models. So it's a very, very important model. Um, and so it predicts photosynthesis and it takes in solar radiation or light and it takes, and its parameters are affected by temperature. But in that model, there's no representation of what I, this conceptual approach here, that if you combine stressful environmental factors together, you get damage. And so this model that we use to predict our future of our world um, has no sense of damage. So if bad things happen to a plant where there's high light and high temperature and drought, and you apply water to that plant, in that model, it recovers the next day. Um, and so we realized that that's, that's something we needed to incorporate. And so what we did, this is Nico uh, Bambach, a PhD student and I, uh, we created an, an extra step in this model that represented a dynamic response of photosynthesis to damage. And so a plant with shuts to mata and high light and high temperature would then be damaged and that would last for a, a week or more. And that represented a loss in photosynthesis and therefore yield. And we're able to show that it actually works very well for almonds, but I think it's a universal model and this, um, our model is universal and the Farko von Camera model is applied universally. So um, those are just two examples of conceptual approaches that I think um, help us frame the questions better. I wanna talk more about water use efficiency now. So I'm gonna talk about water use efficiency, but bear in mind, everything I say is relevant to any analysis that you do where there are derived variables. And what I mean by that is whenever you take two variables and you combine them in some way, so you add them together or you divide one by the other to create another variable. So what I'm gonna to say to you is universal to all correlation or regression type analyses, uh, plots or statistical analyses. So I'm gonna define water use efficiency as the grain yield of a crop divided by its evapotranspiration. And there's also a related term called water productivity. And that's essentially the cost of um, producing, the cost in water of producing grain. And it's just the reciprocal of water use efficiency. So I'm gonna talk about them interchangeably and to avoid confusion, I'm just gonna present them as GY divided by ET or ET divided by GY. So I'm being specific as to what they are. I, I would also point out that evapotranspiration is not easy to measure. And so there's, when you're analyzing water use efficiency data, a big problem is the ET estimates, but I'm not gonna go into that um, issue. So if you go into the agronomy literature, there are many papers that analyze water use efficiency. And the classical way of doing it is analyzing water use efficiency versus grain yield or water use efficiency versus evapotranspiration. And these are standard plots. About 25% of papers in agronomy that deal with water and evapotranspiration plot these kind of plots. So they're widely prevalent. They form the basis of things like um, agricultural water management for international agricultural development, um, choosing between crops and things like that. So I wanna take in a conceptual approach here and think about it a bit more. What is going on and, and is this kind of analysis reasonable? So imagine that we have uh, two random variables and the one, uh, they, they're independent of each other. So evapotranspiration is, this is a simulated data set there. It's a random uh, normal variable. And so is grain yield. And there's no relationship between the two. Forget about these lines for a second. We'll come back to them. They're, they're not meaningful here. So if we fundamentally have no relationship between grain yield and evapotranspiration, what happens if we do that analysis? 
water use efficiency versus grain yield. And what we find is that there's an incredibly strong correlation between water use efficiency and grain yield, despite there being this being two uh, random variables with no relation, fundamental relationship between them. And the R squared is 0.97. So essentially all the variation in ET divided by grain yield is uh, explained by grain yield. Um, this relationship doesn't really exist in a, in a biologically meaningful sense. And so we call it a spurious correlation. And whether you plot it as ET divided by grain yield or grain yield divided by ET, there's still a spurious correlation. And just to illustrate how absurd this is, this dashed line in this graph here, it's a perfect fit, right? That's this line on this graph here. If you back plot it on this graph, that's what they're predicting the fit should be like, which is clearly not uh, a reasonable uh, fit that the raw data. So I'll explain this in a different way, just to make the point. Let's say there really is a relationship between grain yield and evapotranspiration, as indeed there is in, in reality. And let's say it's a linear relationship. If you now solve for ET divided by grain yield versus grain yield, this is the function that relates the two. So the same measured data is on both axes, and that explains why, um, because the same measured data on both axes, that's, that explains why the one variable explains so much variation of the other, it's pretty simple um, why it does that. So typically in regression analysis or correlation, uh, you would um, fit this relationship of y is equal to a plus x plus uh, multiplied x plus b, you'd be happy with that. But you wouldn't ever uh, fit the relationship of y as a function of y, that's absurd, right? You would get 100% of the variation explained. But what, you, what people don't realize when they do water use efficiency analyses is that plotting the ratio of water use efficiency versus one of its components is gonna result in hugely inflated R squareds. So you may think this is a bit silly, but in actual fact, many, many publications make this mistake. And I think the reason is they don't, they don't necessarily realize that water use efficiency and grain yield contain the same data. It's not something they're thinking about. And because they're not expressing it as this ratio and they just say water use efficiency, they don't see that. So here's a real example. This is a relationship that's very strong in a paper from PNAS. And this, is, this paper is uh, one of the fundamental papers in international agricultural development. And they state that at higher grain yields, cropping systems in developing countries have much lower costs of water use, much lower, much higher water use efficiencies than um, production systems with lower grain yields. And so I just wanna take a step back and say that I think this is a great paper and I very much agree with their conclusion. I think what they state as a conclusion is true, but one of the analyses they make, I think could be done better. So I'm critical, but not, I, I'm not contesting the ultimate result of the paper. So let's delve into this a little bit further. Here is barley and wheat, a winter crop or spring crop, uh, sorghum and millet, both summer C4 crops, so very different crops, and they all appear to fit on this one relationship. If we plot the actual raw data, and this is not ever plotted in the paper, then we see something surprising, um, or maybe surprising, is that the actual um, relationship between these two variables, grain yield and evapotranspiration, is a very low correlation. It's there and it supports the ultimate conclusion, um, but it's very variable. And you can see that millet and sorghum and wheat are very different places on that graph and fundamentally have different relationships. Um, and the evidence for this is not as strong as it would appear based upon the spurious correlation here. So these uh, spurious correlations exist in the, in the literature and they're important. Uh, they're important to avoid. So it's all very well pointing that out, but we're still interested in water use efficiency. Um, how do we analyze it? If we can't plot water use efficiency against grain yield or evapotranspiration, and we're still interested in it, 
we need some method of analyzing it. And so um, I'm going to show you how I would suggest you do that. And it's from um, a paper by Music, the data is from a paper by Music et al, a great paper on wheat. And it's a really nice paper because it shows irrigated wheat versus rain fed wheat in terms of grain yield and evapotranspiration. We're interested in water use efficiency. So we can calculate the water use efficiency for the irrigated and rain fed treatments by calculating the average grain yield and eat and evapotranspiration and plotting them as a point. And if we draw a line through the origin, anything on this line has the same water use efficiency. So this point represents the average for the rain fed. Another point over here would have the same water use efficiency as the rain fed wheat, um, any point along this line does. And this is the actual value for the water use efficiency. So we're still looking at water use efficiency here, but we're not using a spurious correlation. And there's something interesting here. So the irrigated wheat appears to have many points below the water use, the average water use efficiency line at low ET, and many points above the line at high ET. So there's the, the suggestion that as you apply more water to irrigated wheat, they become more water use efficient. And we can test that statistically by plotting a line fitting a line. This is a standardized major axis line that's important. Um, I, I won't explain that just yet. And you can look at the confidence interval of the slope of this line and it's steeper than the water use efficiency on average for the irrigated wheat and therefore indeed at higher evapotranspirations or higher um, water inputs wheat becomes more water use efficient. So we're able to get all of the stuff that we could have gotten from the plotting the graph of water use efficiency against grain yield, but we've avoided the um, spurious correlation. This is an interesting idea here. Um, irrigated wheat is more water use efficient than rain fed wheat. And a colleague of mine, Mark Lundy, neatly explained the reason for that is rain falls at bad times and too much rain might fall or not enough rain. Whereas irrigated irrigation, um, occurs at the right time and at the right amount, and therefore the amount of water used by the crop under irrigated conditions is used more efficiently. So we wouldn't have got that out of this data set if we hadn't have taken this approach. Okay, so um, I'd like to emphasize that I've used water use efficiency as an example, but many agronomic analyses, and indeed in many other fields from zoology to plant physiology, this is true. So as long as you're plotting the same measured data on both axes, you can uh, create spurious correlations. And I would take a guess that between 10 and 20% of papers in, the, in any field have spurious correlations in them. So if you express two things using the same denominator, that would create a spurious correlation. If you're plotting harvest index versus yield, because yield is on both axes, the same measured data is on both axes, you create a spurious correlation. And so I warn you that this is a, a major issue that we need to correct as editors or young people going into the field. Um, interestingly, Pearson, who came up with correlations, actually gave it its name and explained the errors of this. We haven't assimilated his warning from more than 100 years ago into our statistics yet. Okay, so that was uh, what I was gonna say about water use efficiency. I wanna talk um, a bit about um, new methods of uh, doing experiments with climate change. So when we say global warming, what is the nature of the warming? And this is really important. If we wanna design an experiment, we want to match it to what is gonna happen in our future. And this is really analogous to cooking bacon. So I'll, I'll bring it back to cooking bacon in the end. Here are two ways of cooking bacon. You can cook bacon on a frying pan. And what's happening there is you're heating up the pot. The pot is heating up uh, the oil, which is frying um, the bacon. Or you could put it on a fire. And what's happening there is the coals are uh, emitting long wave or infrared radiation, which is blasting the surface of the uh, bacon. And that's heating it up. 
Those are two fundamentally different ways of heating bacon and cooking bacon. Now, which one's the right way? Well, if you want fried bacon, clearly frying it is the best option. If you want smoky bacon, well, then the fire is probably a better option. My point is, is that there's lots of methods of doing something, such as climate change research, and depending on what your goal is, you can choose those methods um, more appropriately if you think about it and take a conceptual approach. So the whole bacon story relates very uh, closely to what um, actually will happen under global warming. So let me just explain the greenhouse effect. So um, the sun is blasting the earth with a lot of radiation and heating it up, uh, the atmosphere and the earth. The earth is emitting a lot of long wave or infrared radiation that either is lost to space or captured by greenhouse particles in the atmosphere. And the more greenhouse particles we, we capture in the atmosphere, the more of that radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere. And then it's re-emitted back to the earth um, or the atmosphere or back into space. And the net effect of all this long wave radiation is heating the molecules of the atmosphere up. So under global warming, what's gonna happen is the atmosphere will be hotter, the air temperatures will be hotter. There'll also be a bit more long wave radiation. And I'm not sure that people quite realize this in a quantitative sense, but that little bit of long wave radiation because of the hotter earth um, and because of the trapping of, of the long wave radiation in the atmosphere, it's a very tiny amount. So a typical plant or crop canopy is getting about a thousand watts per meter squared of uh, long wave and short wave radiation blasted at it at any point in time. And the radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases is only about two watts per meter squared. So it's a very small amount. So in terms of climate change, plants aren't gonna get blasted by much more infrared radiation. They're gonna to have to encounter hotter air temperatures. So that's the key thing. Um, it's a bit like the bacon. Um, in, in the fire, it's infrared radiation that's heating the bacon, but in the pan, it's convection or, or conduction from the pan that's heating the bacon. And I think this is of real importance. So if we're interested in evapotranspiration of a crop, then um, how we heat the crop, how we do a climate change experiment around a crop really does matter. So I'm sure you know the penman monteith equation and it predicts how much water use a well-watered crop will, uh, how much water it will use. And it's based upon net radiation. So in, infrared, so short wave and long wave radiation such as infrared. But I've just said that that's not gonna change very much in the future, not in a, a quantitative manner. Um, the wind speed and the air temperature. And not only that, but the vapor pressure deficit or gradient from the crop to the atmosphere is also going to determine water loss. And that's responsive to temperature or air temperature. So the key thing to vary if we're interested in water use efficiency of crops, uh, water use of crops or water use efficiency is to vary air temperature. And just as a reminder, um, the vapor pressure deficit or gradient from a crop is an exponential function of air temperature. So a small increase in air temperature results in a relatively big increase in evapotranspiration. So let's go back to bacon. Um, I love the idea of network analysis and bacon numbers help describe networks. So Elvis Presley is connected in a network by two links to Kevin Bacon because he was in a movie with Edward Asner and Edward Asner was in a movie with Kevin Bacon. So Elvis Presley's Bacon number is two because there's two degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. Um, and it's a useful way to look at networks of interactions and to describe them and to understand what's going on. So this is a network. It is a very, very simple crop model where the yield of a crop is determined by various things and is based upon photosynthesis. And we can ask, what is the Bacon number or what is the network connectivity of different impacts on that system? So for example, carbon dioxide has a very high Bacon number in the sense that it has very few direct effects on our network of interacting factors here. So 
essentially CO2, um, the future increases in CO2, there's only two things that are gonna affect directly. And that is photosynthesis and photorespiration. There are many indirect effects that lead on from that. And so this CO2 changes are gonna be very important, but because they affect relatively few things in the plant um, or the crop, the, the responses are gonna be somewhat predictable. They're still very important to, to study, but we can expect some degree of predictivity um, based upon CO2 having very few direct effects and being thus far away from um, other parts of the crop production system. On the other hand, air temperature uh, or temperature of an organ or temperature of a plant is of paramount importance because every pro process in the universe is responsive to temperature. And that means that uh, air temperature has a Baker number of like one or two much. Uh, it is directly affecting almost every process in a plant and in a model of crop productivity. And so what I'm gonna advocate for, and this is why um, the focus on air temperature is air temperature effects on crops and plants are gonna be much less predictable. And that's where we should start our experimentation. It's important to do other experimentation on CO2 and stuff, but I think air temperature should be the, the initial basis. So how do we do that? Let's take a step back and look at all our options and see how they work. So this is how I um, conceptually broke up all the different experiments that people do on climate change research with regards to temperature. So on this axis, we have the degree of enclosure. So 0% means just an open field and 100% is like a growth chamber or a greenhouse where um, the whole environment is artificial in a sense. And the huge advantage of doing experiments in the greenhouse and, and or growth chambers is that you have ultra high precision of controlling air temperature, which is the other axis. So if you wanna control air temperature and you're just interested in the biology, but not exactly in how it works in the field, then by all means use greenhouse or growth chamber. But what about the field? We wanna measure evapotranspiration in the field. Um, how do we do that? So one of the original methods were, were these um, enclosures. And these are simply plastic over a, a plant. And what happens is the solar radiation comes in and the heat gets trapped in there. And as a result, it's much hotter in those chambers. But there's no temperature control. It's just reliant on, on um, solar heating. The problem is at night, there's no solar heating. And so the temperature changes disappear at night. So it's an uncontrolled system. And so I'm gonna say these, these particular enclosures are relatively enclosed and they have very low precision of air temperature control. There's nothing wrong with them. If your goal is to study many, many species of plants or have many different treatments, then these are a feasible way and a cheap way of installing something in a remote environment where you don't have lots of electricity and so forth. So they're very appropriate depending on what your question is, but they also have issues. So the next evolution in this um, was open top chambers. And open top chambers operate on a similar principle, but they have more control and they have electricity. So you can have a fan heating it or you can have cooling systems. And there's always a fan blowing in it so that you can have mixing of air. Um, these are much more controllable systems. And so you have much higher precision of air temperature control, but you also have a high amount of enclosure of this crop. So if you want experimental systems on crops uh, with lots of control, open top chambers are a pretty good way of doing that. The problem is that for evapotranspiration or water use research and, and for other um, field processes, they're kind of artificial in that there's always a fan going on in there. There's no um, realistic wind environment. And so it'd be nice for some experiments to avoid the open top chamber approach have a more free air environment. So this is achieved by growing plants in different places, either um, with different latitudes or different altitudes. So for example, we can grow um, spring wheat over the winter in the Imperial Valley in California. And by March, there's a 100, 100 degree weather and the, the wheat is, is finished at that point. 
or we can grow wheat in Tule Basin in Northern California at high altitude. And some years it snows in the middle of winter, sorry, some years it snows in the middle of summer and ends, we grow winter wheat in the summer in Tule Lake and some years it snows in the middle of summer. So by using altitude and latitude, you can do climate change experiments where you have a relatively good degree of control over the average season temperature. The problem with these experiments is that often soil changes, often precipitation changes, and often um, the latitude differences mean that you have problems with day length. So for example, in Southern California, we have to grow short day onions and in Northern California, long day onions. So it's not a perfect system. It's a great system for some experiments, but, but not necessarily for others. I'm saying field sites are low enclosure, which is great for water use research, but we don't have a lot of control over some things like precipitation and so forth. The final experimental system are infrared heaters. And this is called the various uh, things called T-phase or uh, FATI, so free air temperature increase using infrared heaters. And so electricity passes through these infrared heaters, and this can be done on a crop or a natural ecosystem. And it shines long wave radiation at the crop. And because this is not um, photosynthetically active radiation, it doesn't change productivity or yield of photosynthesis or uh, phytochromes and things like that. It just heats the crop. And the key thing is that it heats the surface of the crop or the plants and it heats the soil. It doesn't actually heat the air. So go back to the bacon story and the climate change story. Um, Although infrared heating is involved in global, um, in the greenhouse effect, it's the change in air temperature that is what's gonna affect plants in the future. Whereas this method changes the surface temperature. It doesn't change the air temperature directly. Um, I, I'd like to emphasize that this method is super uh, fast because it's electrically controlled and it's super versatile and you can put it on a field in a short space of time. And so this has become the most popular method for good reason. It's uh, very versatile and easy to use. And so for good reasons, it has become the most popular method. But I would like to advocate that there's one more method that's missing. And that is we need an open air system like the, these infrared systems, but that heats the air and not the surface of the plants. Um, I want to justify that in two ways. The first is that the radiative increase due to climate change is going to be small in the future. Um, whereas these infrared heating experiments will increase the radiation load on the plants by a much, much larger amount to heat the surface of the plants. So I think that's a useful mechanism, but it's not entirely uh, appropriate. And I should point out that this is well understood by the people who do these experiments. So. It's not like, um, it's well acknowledged. It's just a fundamental limitation of that system. Let me illustrate the impact of that choice. So this is a relationship for soybeans between leaf temperature and air temperature. And you can see that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. And the reason is that at higher temperatures, there's more evapotranspiration from the soybeans and therefore they're cooler than you would expect otherwise. And so if you heated up the canopy of a, um, a soybean crop by four degrees Celsius by infrared heating, that would be equivalent to a seven degree increase in air temperature. So there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between um, the expectation for a leaf temperature experiment and the air temperature experiment. And then under water stress conditions, when the stomata are shut and there's no more evaporative cooling, then it does become a one-to-one -one relationship. And so, Effectively, the treatment size for infrared um, heating experiments changes over the course of uh, a dry down of tomato closure and so forth. So this is not ideal. It's what we have to live with, and this is a very useful method. So I, I really encourage you to use this method if you need to, um, but there are issues there that we would like to solve. And so I would like a high precision air temperature control experiment with as minimal enclosure as possible. And I have a proposal for that. So the proposal is called a lot of hot air or aloha. And conveniently, the system that I'm proposing can use um, 
entirely uh, parts that are entirely available from HVAC systems. So the heating and cooling systems in buildings, those parts are available and they're relatively cheap for use in a field environment. So that's nice. I don't have to invent new technology in a, in a technological sense. And what I'm proposing, and to some degree I've tested, and I'm looking for people to work with me or um, work on this, is that we wrap a plant with um, pipes, and the pipes are really small. They, they're very narrow little pipes, and the pipes carry hot water. And so you pump in hot water near the top of a canopy, and by the time it gets to the bottom of the canopy, it's cooled down because the air is cooling it. And because air is moving across those pipes, it heats the air surrounding that canopy. And this is just a conceptual model. One could have, uh, much like face experiments, directional heating. So whatever direction the wind is blowing from could be the side that's heated. So this is just an illustrative um, model, model. And this would simply run off a, um, heat, a hot water heater at a high temperature and a digital mixer and digital mixes, you can tell it the temperature you want the water coming out of the digital mixer to be. And it will give you that based upon a hot water input and a cold water input. And it's very fast. And then you have a variable speed pump to pump hot water through the system. So this is not as simple as it might seem. This is a video, but I uh, didn't think it would work um, via Zoom. But the video shows basically that this anemometer here spins very fast above a canopy. And this anemometer near the top of a canopy spins less fast. And this anemometer in the canopy spins almost uh, not at all. And the point is that canopies are not just one wind environment. There's a logarithmic profile of wind into a canopy with much less wind in the canopy. And so any system for heating a canopy with hot air uh, would have to account for that. The, the reason being that the faster the wind around a hot pipe, the less opportunity there is for the air to heat up and the less heating there will be of the air. A slower wind for the same temperature pipe will heat the air more because the wind is not being blown away and it has opportunity to heat up. This can all be modeled using convection dynamics, which is what I did. And then if you have a cooler pipe, then there'll be less heating too because the pipe is less hot. So the problem is that with height above the canopy, there's uh, more and more wind and it decreases into the canopy. And in order to account for that, so you have the same heating at all heights, what you would have to do is space the pipes of the system, this Aloha system, at different spacings. So the more they would be closely spaced up at the top of the um, way, way above the canopy um, so that the maximum heating would occur there and very little heating would be needed with as low wind speed in the canopy. Oh, by the way, I, I increased the size of this graph dramatically to, to make that point, um, but the actual pipes are very small and they wouldn't be anywhere near touching each other here. There's sort of five centimeter difference in spacing between the pipes up, um, up at the top. So we've, we've got a control principle for this um, system. If we have different spacing of pipes, we can have differential heating with height and therefore um, more even temperature elevation across the whole canopy of a pipe. The other thing that's going on is that if the pipe is hot when it comes into the system at the top, by the time it gets to the bottom, it will be cool. And so therefore there'll be less heating at the bottom because the pipe will be cooler. If you increase the flow rate of water through the system, then there'll be less opportunity for the water to cool down and the pipes will be heating uh, the air more at the bottom of the system than otherwise. So by varying flow rate through the system, we can control where in the, with height, the heating is occurring. And it turns out that if we wanna elevate the air temperature by let's say one degree Celsius across the whole canopy uniformly, and so a combination of having um, the spacing, some more dense spacing of pipes at the top, and by changing the flow rate of water through the pipe, we can actually achieve a very consistent um, uh, temperature elevation across the whole canopy. So we have two very reasonable flow, no, sorry, uh, 
two really reasonable control principles by which we could run the system. And then the final um, issue, this is a um, experimental test where we have copper pipes and we, very, we took thermocouples and moved them away and towards the copper pipes and we had wind sensors and we had uh, wind. What we found is that it's very predictable um, what temperature the pipes need to be if we want to change the air to a certain degree. So this is a rather complex diagram. The, mo the important thing is, is the system is predictable. So if we want to know what the temperature of the pipe needs to be in order to um, increase the air by a certain amount, all we need to know is the wind speed and the air temperature. And then that is a predictable um, equation then. And so we have experimental data showing that this is very predictable for a large range of pipe temperatures and air temperatures and wind speeds. And if it's a convection model very well. So um, this is my proof that the system is feasible in a, a technological sense. Um, the, there are two issues with the system. The one issue is that if the pipe temperature is 90 degrees Celsius, which is about as hot as it could ever get, and the wind's fast, then the elevation of air temperature that you could achieve is only about one degree Celsius or just less than that. So in windy environments, it's gonna be very difficult to heat the air in a canopy of crop by much. In less windy environments, you can get up to three degree increase in air temperature. Um, so if you're interested in forest understories and forestry and, and propagation of seedlings, the system would work incredibly well. In a windy environment, or windy conditions, it works less well. Um, someone asked, do I plan to use distilled water? There are all kinds of technological issues there uh, with the piping and the type of pipes and so forth that um, we're thinking about, but you're right, that's an important thing. Okay, so here's a proposed system. There are three control principles that um, should allow us control of the air moving across the plants to a reasonable uh, amount of accuracy. How would it actually work in um, a field? So this is data from um, Merced, which is in the Central Valley of California and is an is a agricultural production system. And there are very few calm conditions. And of course, the system won't work well in calm conditions where there's no wind. It needs that wind to move the hot air from the pipes across the canopy. So, it will work in most conditions because wind is always present. The wind is only rarely above three or four meters per second. And therefore it's a nice range of wind speeds, a medium range of wind speeds where at least a one degree increase in air temperature would be possible. So I think it's feasible um, within a crop canopy in the Central Valley of California. And it seems to, um, it, it seems feasible. So I mentioned one thing is that is wind speed greatly affects the degree by which you can increase air temperature. The other issue is more important, and that is that the power consumption, the electricity needed to heat, the water needed to heat these pipes is a huge amount of electricity. So I've totally forgotten the number, but it's something like three or more times electricity than the infrared heating experiments. So if you have budget issues, the infrared heating experience experiments offer a huge advantage over this technology. Um, so the, for one replicate system, it costs about $5,000 a year to heat the water for that system. And that seems a lot. So this is the relationship between the power consumption and wind speed. And this is a very nice relationship. The more wind there is, the more heating you need and the more electricity you need. And that gives us an idea. So um, we don't wanna just create carbon emissions and spend a huge amount of money to um, dump electricity into a heating system that just lets the heat disappear into the atmosphere. We want to do something that's more financially and uh, CO2 sustainable. And because of this relationship, wind power supplies electricity just when the system needs it. Under high wind conditions, we would have more electricity using wind power. And so 
with a standard um, agricultural production system turbine, so these are turbines that are standardly used uh, across California, that would um, supply enough electricity at the right time to have replicate systems. And so I think this is a, uh, that makes this feasible. Um, you would have a capital cost rather than running costs. Okay, so um, hopefully I've convinced you of some things. The one is that air temperature, I think is of paramount importance to study because it's the thing that is least predictable about how plants are gonna to respond to future climates. The other thing is when you're choosing methods that use different ways of heating, or this is a general principle, if you're choosing between methods, try and distinguish between them based upon what you want to do biologically. So it makes sense to use infrared heating of crop canopies um, if you're not so much interested in water use and you don't have a lot of money to run in a more expensive system. On the other hand, um, there are other technologies that might be appropriate. So if you're experimentally testing how um, bean pollination, not pollination, um, bean pollen responds to high temperature at night, which is a major limitation for bean um, production, you could do that in a growth chamber because the biology, you, you wanna break down the biology in a very simple manner and you're not trying to scale up to a whole field scale for that type of experiment. So choose your experiments. Um, no, no one experiment is realistic in all circumstances. So hopefully I haven't tried a cellular used car. Um, I'm not advocating this Aloha system is universally applicable. I think it can be used in certain circumstances. And the one that comes to mind is evapotranspiration and water use, crop water use in the field. Um, studies of that. And then finally, um, I'd encourage grad students in particular to take this opportunity that COVID represents where you may not have um, field experiments, you may have the ability to stay at home and think about what you're doing. Um, it's an opportunity to develop conceptual approaches to your problems. Um, and I think I've given you some examples of how that can be useful in designing future field experiments and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for this excellent talk. Uh, so I'm looking at my chat um, field here. So you either, to the audience, you're, you're free to either type your question in the chat box or, or raise your hand and, um, and I will give you the floor to uh, verbalize your question directly to, uh, to Matt. Let's see, no questions yet. All right, I might, might uh, start myself, Matt, Matthew, about, uh, about a question. So could you, so you talked about spurious correlations, right? And the fact that sometimes you, some of the information on variable X is captured by variable Y. We have also other types of spurious correlations where basically things, especially in the kind of phenotyping space where you measure a lot of things and we have now technologies that allows us to measure many, many things. And uh, we, we, in, in our discriminating brains, we're trying to come up with like those correlations. So sometimes we could see very strong correlations between things that are kind of a um, little bit disconnected, at least conceptually. Could you offer us some thoughts about how to navigate that as well? Um, so I, I know what you mean when you have a hundred random variables and you correlate them all to each other, you're going to find some significant relationships just by looking at many different correlations. And I don't think I'd call that spurious correlation, or at least if you wanted to call it that it wouldn't be the same. It's not occurring due to the same mechanism as this. So uh, it, it is, it is a very big problem, particularly when you have many variables. Um, and, and there's all kinds of corrections like Bonferroni corrections and so forth. My, my uh, approach there is to rather say, 
Um, many years ago, people did, did all these calculations by hand. And so they couldn't afford to make 100 correlation analyses because they would have to do the calculations. And so what they did is they said, what are the ones that matter and what are our hypotheses and which ones should we plot? And I think that's probably the way to go in a general sense. With machine learning and so forth, then that's a whole different uh, ball game. And they have ways of dealing with that that I'm not usually familiar with. So we're basically uh, uh, proposing a uh, parsimonious hypothesis making as a way to navigate that yes. situation. Okay. All right. So I'm um, looking at the questions here. Um, all right. A lot of questions. Okay. Um, so Medicine Moses asks, uh, is the startup cost of the Aloha system comparable to the infrared? Um, I, I think it's relatively comparable. The, the size of the heater that you need depends on the size of the experimental plots you have. And so if you were doing a really big one, you'd have to have a very big heater, water heater, and that would cost a lot more. So it depends on the scaling, but, but I think the costs are not, the, the costs of the electricity, not the, the major cost is not the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, along the same lines, Matt is, uh, he, yeah, he, he follows up with uh, another part of the question. Uh, could it be used in conjunction with the traditional phase infrastructure to measure the interactive effects between uh, CO2 and, and temperature? Absolutely. I thought yeah. about the same, I had the same question in mind. I, and that would be the hope. It, it would, the hope would be to do it um, in a field where there's natural soils and you're trying to be as less invasive as possible to the, the field structure and canopy and everything. And face would fit very nicely with that. Uh, a question from Ford, um, Ford Dennison. So his question is, isn't the air temperature that matters in the boundary layer? Can we control that using radiant heaters? So you're right. The boundary layers of either the canopy or the leaves are much less mixed than the, than the general atmosphere. Um, if you heat a leaf with a radiant heater, it will heat its boundary layer to some extent. And the question is, how much does that happen and how does that relate to wind? So you may have air heating around leaves under calm conditions, but much less under um, high wind conditions. And to my knowledge, that is something that is completely unexplored. Um, obviously, it's explored by micrometeorologists, but not by the um, the T-phase, the infrared heating um, groups. So I think that's a very good point, but it's it's something that's relatively unexplored. I'm gonna quickly take advantage of my position here to, to ask another quick question. Just like, because people are, seem to be interested in the, in, you know, how to use this in other climate change experiments. Are there any caveats uh, like, uh, that comes to mind that are similar to the way temperature treatments are applied when, you, when it comes to CO2? Uh, kind of phase mm -hmm. experiments. Are the, are the, are, are, like quickly, do you have like caveats of that mm -hmm. nature to think about? Well, so um, I, I think the phase experiments are, other than their cost, um, are actually pretty good. The thing that I've realized in doing this is that um, na nature has some temporal variation in temperatures or CO2. Um, but when you start adding temperature or heat, or you start adding CO2 to a system, you increase the magnitude of those variations. So what phase does, and you don't probably don't realize it, um, is that there's huge variations in CO2 concentration around these plants. And there's been some work on whether that matters or not. And it doesn't seem to matter too much. But the point is, is as soon as you try and change the environment with phase or he heating, you're changing, you're increasing the standard deviation of the temperature or CO2 variation by, by orders of magnitude. And it's something that's not widely thought of. And so that is an issue with face, or at least it's something that happens with face. Okay. Um, all right, I have a question from Jose. He has two questions. We'll start by question number one. What use efficiency is often measured instantaneously as uh, the amount of uh, like the ratio between water and CO2 exchange and compared to yield? Do you see a problem of spurious associations with this particular correlation between water use efficiency and yield? So that, that's a great question. Um, because 
so we call that intrinsic water use efficiency from gas exchange system. And because that doesn't actually share measured data with, with yield, there's no problem of uh, correlating those two. Um, but if you took intrinsic water use efficiency, which in most cases is equal to photosynthesis divided by its model conductance, so if you took intrinsic water use efficiency and plotted it against the model conductance, that would have a spurious correlation. So the, the key idea is that is measured data shared between the axes. And you want to avoid that. Okay. And his second question is, in the ALOHA method, how does air mixing and distance affect air temperature? I am thinking about screening large populations, which is obviously many people here are thinking about. Uh, if it would make sense to use a large system surrounding several plots, or if one would need a single system per plot. Um, it, it very much depends on how much electricity you have and, and the design of the system. Big systems, the, the, the catch is that you could have as big a system as you wanted, but then the, the height of the enclosure would have to be proportionally bigger. So you would be, you, if you expanded it to a field size, you would have to have a, I, I, don't, I don't have a number, but a hundred foot high set of pipes around that field and a huge heating system. So I don't ever see it being practical in that sense for large systems. But I, I think that's a good, you, you're alluding to a good, a really good question there. And that is, how do you extend something that you can only do in a small group of plants to a whole breeding population? And my approach there is to take promising parents for a, your existing breeding population or a future one, phenotype them in a system like this, and then come up with the characteristics that give them the, the advantage under higher temperatures, and then go and phenotype for that. You probably don't have to use this system to phenotype for it once you know exactly what to look for. So try and build the knowledge around a small system and then apply to the broad field in a much easier, extensive phenotyping manner. Okay, thanks. So John has a follow-up question, which is in your hot water Aloha system, how are you planning to avoid or manage the issue of minerals? No, he asked this question before. Yeah, the uh, yeah. distilled water and the uh, divinized water. So yeah. I, I, it, it's a, a great question. We have very bad water in California that's full of stuff like that. Um, I, I think it would probably end up having to be, so solar systems, solar water heating systems do this all the time. They pump uh, liquid through pipes uh, to transfer heat. And often it's um, very different liquids than water. And I think maybe that might be a direction one would have to go in. Um, but there are all kinds of other little issues. Like for instance, copper pipe has a low emissivity, which is really good for the system. It won't emit lots of infrared radiation. But over time, if the copper pipe punishes, the emissivity changes, which would be bad. It, it tends to increase. And so those kind of things are things that um, are important things to deal with. Okay. Let's see if we have other questions. So um, I think in my mind, uh, there is this remaining important question, which you hinted to in your, in your kind of abstract or introduction. So have you given any thought about, you know, how to make plants help us predict the weather? Oh, um, so I, this is an ongoing experiment that I have. I, I stepped back from this and I said, well, can plants predict the weather? And the answer was very much yes. So you, in order to predict the weather, you have to have very predictable weather, something that is predictable. And the two things that are very predictable are day night. And that's why plants evolve circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are plants ways of predicting daytime, nighttime. So it's very much, yes, they can predict the daytime, nighttime. And then seasonal variation and photo period and things like that are also predicting the weather or at least the climate. Um, and they're very effective at, plants are very effective at doing that. So then my question was, well, now that I know that, what else in the world is predictable? 
And the kinds of things that are predictable is that weather doesn't come through in, weather isn't random. Um, for instance, we have five days of sunny weather and now tomorrow we're gonna have five days of rainy weather. And so are those phenomena, the weekly time, time period phenomena, are those predictable enough for plants to do something about the weather that's coming or, so for instance, if today's sunny, can a plant bet that tomorrow is gonna to be sunny too? And I think in many circumstances they can, but the question is what do they do around that? And my guess is that flowering and floral things um, are very important to predict the weather and maybe those are the things that are able to do that. I mean, I resonated with the idea, I loved it. Uh, because it's it's consistent with with the examples you just mentioned. Also, with some work, uh, there's work by a group in Montpellier who showed that kind of plants kind of remember the previous the VPD of the last three days, let's say. Mm -hmm. And if they see like, oh, I had plenty of water on the soil in my roots, but the the air is becoming drier, so let me like alter how many aquaporins I have in my system. Mm -hmm. To regulate how much water I'm going, I'm going to allowing to to use. So it's, it's it's like there's this kind of weird loop, which we can anthropomorphize and make it seem like plants kind of dissipate and think. And mm -hmm. um, so there's some something there, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly the kind of example I was thinking of. That's great. Um, all right, Ford has a follow-up question. So what if an open top chamber. And by the way, you guys should connect because he's, he's a great experimentalist as well. Uh, what if an open top chamber mimicked uh, outside conditions rather than having a constant fan? Um, that would be fascinating to uh, look at. I think that, that one issue there would be that the amount of solar heating would be partly related to how, how fast the fans were. And so there might be an issue with, with, if you match the fans running to the wind in the field, you might end up having excessive heating when you don't want it. But I, I do think that that's something that could be uh, investigated. And there's nothing wrong with open top chambers. They're very useful, particularly um, their huge advantage is that you don't have, if you're gonna do CO2 response um, experiments, you don't have to pump so much CO2 around the plants basis problem is that you have to pump a huge amount of CO2 around the plants because it just blows away. So it has huge advantages, but um, there are issues as well. I, um, I, I'm not sure, Ford, but I, I think at one point I thought that this was your office, your old office. <laughs> uh, 2314 in plant environmental sciences. All right, for those who are not aware of the exchange is that uh, uh, Ford is, at, is saying, you're in my former department and to which Matthew responded that I might be in your office actually. So yeah, it looks familiar to, to, uh, to Ford, definitely. That's what he says. That's funny. Um, that, just to, I want a final question I have in mind. So probably not, you know, Prince Brian in this presentation, but I know your work and I know you're, you did, and you said it actually, you did a lot of, you did some high throughput phenotyping work. And uh, again, from this physiology perspective, do you have any pieces of wisdom to share, to, to, to share, to share with, uh, with the grad students who are engaged in, in those high throughput experiments? Hmm. So um, we were gonna do a big experiment this summer, but COVID stopped it. So we're gonna do it the coming summer. Um, of high throughput phenotyping of 300, physiology of 300 genotypes of beans. So there will be data one day. Um, my realization is that to some extent you wanna do really high quality phenotyping of physiology, but you can't do that on a big population. And so I've tended to focus very intensive um, quality phenotyping on a small population, learn what I can and then realize that there's genetic vari uh, phenotype, phenotypic variation in something that I can then figure out a, a phenotyping method that applies to a whole population. So you don't have to phenotype the whole population uh, 
for everything, phenotype it for what matters, the whole population, and then focus on the smaller, but maybe the parents and um, uh, progeny that have very different yields to just work out what's going on to learn how to phenotype the whole population. Okay, so basically like do a first round of experiment where you try to compare like genotypes with which a priori should be different. Mm -hmm. And then through that knowledge develop like maybe a proxy trait that is cheaper that you can use kind of to screen larger populations. That, yeah. Because you would, you would understand the specific conditions under which this trait expresses itself. Exactly. So the, the good example of that is you can look at gas exchange and stomata and all this stuff um, on very few genotypes. But canopy temperature would be a basic and very easy proxy of all those things that you can measure on a whole population. Yeah, that's true. All righty. Uh, I don't see other questions. And uh, I think this is perhaps the right time to give you a break, Matthew. So um, uh, on behalf of uh, APS and uh, everyone attending here, I'm sure I'd like to thank you again for uh, for your presentation and for your time. And uh, yeah, wish you all the luck for your uh, next experiment in the summer. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a sure. pleasure.